Hey guys, today we're setting up our dynamic footstep sounds with water. Shallow, medium, and of course, deep. Let's get to it. Hey guys, this is our fourth and final episode on sound for quite a while at least, but it still begs the question, why all this focus on sound? And really with any game, typically you've got two senses to work with. You got sight and you got sound. And to be honest, sight is like 95% of game development. So if we get that five to 10% of sound right, we're in really good shape. It's essential to get it right, or at least not get it wrong, because if a sound occurs in the game and it just feels off, it can derail the entire experience. But next episode, we're on the Niagara effects, and then we're gonna go from there. Another quick caveat, I strongly encourage you to check out at least the previous episode on footsteps if you haven't already set up footstep sounds for your character. We're basically making functions that are very similar to the ones we made last episode. We're getting our water depth by looking at where is the water level and then where's the ground beneath it, or is it so far beneath it that it's really deep water? And then based on that water depth, we're then playing the appropriate sound. And we'll set up jump sounds in exactly the same way. They're just a little bit more robust. And the last thing we'll do today, kind of a cherry on top, but I think it's essential to get a realistic player experience, is we'll slow down the character as he gets into deeper and deeper water. And then as he comes out of the water, speed him up back up to his normal speed. And I realized we needed to do this because realistically, you wouldn't have running sounds if the water's up to like chest level. It's just not gonna happen. And you'll see that once we get into the preparation steps for this episode. At deeper water depths, we don't need to actually have running sounds because the player's not gonna be running. So here are the key concepts for this episode. Most of this we already covered last episode, but we're just building on the things that we learned. We are doing a new kind of trace this episode, a line trace in order to get the water level, and that's gonna compare against the sphere trace, that's the ground level that we got last episode. But there are a couple things that we haven't done before in this series that you'll see in this episode. So last episode we did function inputs, but this episode we have functions with outputs. And then also delay node. And delays, these are something that you're gonna be using all the time. And they're very simple, but good to get started on them. And just like last episode, there's a lot of preparation for this episode. In the description below, you'll find a link to the spreadsheet with links to Zapsplat. All the sounds you need are there, they're for free. But the one problem I ran into is Zapsplat doesn't really have deep water sounds. And so I struggled a little bit how do I do this and you're gonna see how I made those sounds in the next segment and before we really get into the build of this episode I'm gonna show you all the different sounds the folder structures the sound cues for everything how I built those so you can copy this exactly if you want to follow along so I was doing just fine finding shallow and kind of ankle medium deep water on zap splat something like but I couldn't find any sounds where the water sounded like it was at knee level or even higher up and I was thinking to myself, like, how do we do this? And so I came up with this idea. And if you got a better idea, please let me know. But I took all the medium water sounds that we got. And what I did is I created a few different variations of these. So all the ones where the sound started like right away, like right here, I kept those. So I deleted out like this one and this one and this one, this one I kept. Yeah, so like those four, five, I guess it's four, and we can export those to a wave file and that would be one variation of it so that'd be like water deep 001 down to one wave file so then what i did is i just dragged in all seven again and i cut out different ones at random and by doing that i created about three variations of deep sounds and then for even deeper sounds i had the idea of basically doing two things so i dragged in the deep sounds and so this would be for water up to like knee level maybe. But what if I need something that's like waist level or even deeper? And so for that, what I did is I selected the sound file for the deep sound. And then we went to effect change pitch. And I just lowered the pitch by about 5%. So that already makes it sound a little bit deeper. And then the other thing I did is I lowered the speed down 10%. So that's effect change speed. So the speed multiplier would be 0.9. And now... So that's sounding a lot deeper, like the water is quite a bit deeper. So for each of these variations to mirror the deep sound, I went ahead and I exported them as mega deep. So now before we really get into it, I wanna go through all my setup of sound cues, all of that stuff. So just like last episode, we're working in the character human footsteps folder, I created a new folder for water. And this is organized into five different depths. So we have basically puddle, ankle, knee, thigh, and then full body. 
and there's really only four tiers of sound. So in the spreadsheet in the description below, you've got direct download links for kind of the puddle depth and the angle level. But then for the other two, the deep and the mega deep that you just saw me do in Audacity, that you've got to create via Audacity for free, or if you've got other deep water audio files that you found, use those. And then for the final depth here, I'll show you what I did. But let's start with depth one. So both this and depth two, I've organized into the three folders, jump land, running, walking that you're used to seeing for last episode. So let's start with running. And I'll just show you the sound cue for each of these. So the key things to take away, volume multiplier and our attenuation settings. For all of these sound cues, I'm simply using the hard surface attenuation that we created last episode. And the reason for that is like a water splash, it's gonna go pretty far out into the distance, kind of the equivalent of stepping on stone. And so that's an inner radius of 50, fall off distance of 950. And I'll quickly cover the others. So this was running. Let's go over walking. So this is just a little bit quieter. And then for the jump land sounds, this gets a little bit tricky. And some of the sound cues I've set up are a little bit more complicated. So I'll go over those. So this is both the run sounds and the walk sounds. I'm randomizing each one and then I'm mixing them together in the mixer. And then the output is a little bit louder, 0.5. So let me show you. It still sounds like I'm stepping into a puddle, but it's kind of a harder sound than the others. All right, over to depth two, ankle. Same kind of thing. So running, 0.4, same attenuation. Walking, 0.25, a little bit quieter for this. Jump land, same kind of thing. But I took out a couple of the sounds because they just didn't sound good together. And then because there's only two sounds per random node, what I did is I unchecked this randomize without replacement. And so that way it could play the same sound over again, but the chances of both of them playing the same sound over again are pretty low. And besides this I'm using for jump landing, the player is not gonna be hopping, 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 repeating that same sound over and over. I mean, maybe, but that's gonna be unlikely. So yeah, so it does repeat sometimes, but again, they're not gonna be jumping in place all the time. All right, on to our depth three. So for this, these are the sounds I showed you how to make in Audacity. And so for this, I just took all of the sounds, put them in a single walk cue, because at that depth, the player's speed is gonna slow down, and so they'll just be walking in that case. But there is something unique to this. So note the volume there, but what's unique is the modulator. So the modulator, it's one of these nodes over here. What you can do is you can actually alter the pitch and the volume directly in the cue itself, and you can randomize that a little bit. And that's what I did for the pitch here. So the pitch is lowered even more to give it that deep sound, but it's randomized. So it's between 0.8 and 1, and that gives it a different sound every time. And the reason the volume is lowered here is because the player is not going to be moving that quickly in that deeper water. And now the jump land. So for this, the volume is higher, so 0.3. And for this as well, I'm using a modulator, but the modulator is even deeper. So instead of going up to one, it's just 0.8 to 0.95. And the last thing I did was I duplicated the sound and I basically gave it a double effect. So when the player jumps, it's like the sound hitting twice. So let me show you what that sounds like. It sounds like they're jumping into like knee high water. On to depth four, thigh level, same kind of thing. Let's start with walking. These are the mega deep sounds, and this is kind of weird, but you gotta remember that the player's entire waist is gonna be below water. So because of that, there's a little bit of sound, but the water movement is really happening under the water. And so the sound is greatly reduced. So in the output here, I did something kind of weird. I changed the volume multiplier down to 0 0.02, so very, very quiet. And then our pitch, I lowered that considerably. So it's like the sound is emanating from underwater because it is. But for our jump land, that's gonna be loud. So for that one, the volume 0.4, pitch is its normal thing. And then the modulator here, I lowered the pitch just a little bit. So let's try that out. And to be honest, I could even increase this volume more, but we'll keep it at 0.4 for now. Last thing, so what happens when the player jumps into very deep water and it's basically their entire body that goes in. So that's this full body here. So let's start with not submerged. And so for that, I took the mega deep sounds, but also the regular deep, basically all the sounds that we created in Audacity. I took out the ones that just didn't sound good and I combined them all together in a mixer. The one other thing I did is I added a slight delay of 0.05 seconds to one of these, because if I didn't do that, it had this weird kind of it's hard to describe. It's like a sound echo effect. I'm sure there's a technical term for it, but it just doesn't sound good. And then the last thing was the modulation still lowered the pitch even more. So 0 0.75, 0 0.85. So this is if the player's full body goes into the water, but basically not their head. They're not plunging completely underneath. 
And so for this one, their whole body goes in, including their head. So the player's submerged. Let's listen to that. And the way I accomplish that effect is with the modulation, I just lowered the pitch a lot. So 0 0.6 is 0 0.65. And that's what gives it that kind of like watery feel, like plunging in the water. So once you've got all those sound cues set up, we are ready to rock and roll. Let's jump right into it. So to start, we've got two different types of water in our level, and you might be using one or the other or both of these. So I'm gonna show you how to get this working for both. But one is our new UE5 water system water here with a river. But we've got a problem, right? Because as I'm taking steps here, you see our sphere trace is not hitting the water. Uh, so that's our first problem. It's hitting the ground underneath, but not the actual water. And then for the other water system, let me just run over to that. Yeah, we have the same exact problem here. So sphere trace not actually hitting the water. So how do we go about fixing that? So for this, we're gonna use a different kind of trace called a line trace. And so if you go back into your animation blueprint, so for me, that's under content, core, my animation blueprint here, and we're building off of what we set up last episode. So we've got a couple of events here, and I'm just gonna go off my Atom Notify left foot plan. And to start, I'm just gonna disconnect this. I'm gonna move this out to the left-hand side here, just to give it some space. And we're gonna copy all the setup that we have previously for doing a sphere trace, but now we're gonna do a line trace. And the line trace is going to be by profile. So I can drag out my execution pin, line trace by profile. And I'll connect up our start and our end for the line trace. And now the way I think this is supposed to work is for our new water over here, if I select like one of our rivers, we've got a profile assigned. Yeah, here it is, collision profile name, water body collision. The way I thought this was going to work is I was going to put our profile in here and then that's what warranted it being hit by the line trace. And turns out that that was not the case. I'm not sure if I'm doing this wrong or if this just isn't set up that way, but basically what this is doing, this line trace by profile, is it's hitting everything, regardless of whether it matches on this profile name or not. So if you know the reason for that, please post in the comments below. I'd really like to know the reason why. Uh, and maybe I'm just not using this right, but regardless, we are going to get this working because even if we leave this profile blank, because this is hitting everything, including water, we can get an out hit, we can break the hit result, and we can identify if the physical material is water. But the first thing we gotta do is we actually have to create a physical material for water. So let's do that. So if you followed along last episode, we did that under content and we went to third person into our maps and our third person map shared assets. And so from here, I can just right click, I can create a new physical material under physics and then physical material. And it's gonna be a class physical material. And we're gonna call this water underscore PM. Now you'll also remember from last episode that we have to go into our project settings because we have to add our surface type. So let's go to project settings let's search for surface and we can add an additional one of water. And then back in our physical material, just go into that, change it from default to water, and we are all set for our physical material. And so now, how do we get our water physical material actually associated with our water? And so we got two different types of water in our world. So for this type, if you're using like a regular plane for water, like I am here, then what we need to do is we need to go into that material on the right-hand side, details panel, and we can assign our physical material there. So water underscore PM and then save and close out of that. And the other thing you probably need to do in that case is go into your static mesh for that kind of water material and give it a simple collision. So I'm just gonna give this a box collision because if it doesn't have a collision, there's nothing for the line trace to collide with. Now for the rivers and lakes that are part of the new UE5 water system that we set up in episode 16. So for that, we have to go down, down, down into the details panel and I found that this doesn't really work, that physical material there. But if you go into the actual water material here, so water material river, scroll down there, and we are going to do the same thing. So if you can see that, we're gonna give that water underscore PM. And the same thing for our lake. And what was strange though, is I found that that did not work for our lake. So I suspect that that's a bug because it really should be working for the lake. So if I select our water body lake and water material lake there, should be doing the same thing. Uh, but I found it's not working. So if you know how to fix that, please let me know. If I can't fix that, I suspect that UE5 will fix it with the due course of time once water is no longer experimental. But if it's not fixed, what I'll do is I'll take our lake, 
I'll transition that into a blueprint and then I'll just add kind of like a fake plane there that I can get collision on and it's not going to actually do anything, but the collision plane will at least be able to collide and then play the corresponding effects. And so now let's test this out and see if this works. So if I go to our content drawer, back to our animation blueprint. And so what I'm going to do here is from our line trace by profile, I'm just going to do a print string and we're just going to print our physical material and we'll see if that's registering the water over our water body. The other thing I'll do here is I'll change our debug to for duration and that'll draw a line straight down. Then we'll be able to see that line trace. So now I can see in the top left corner, it's printing our material. And if I go over to the water here, yep, it's registering our river water. Perfect. And now I just need to check our other type of water. And you'll see that's registering too, but we have a little bit of a problem. So I call this the Jesus effect. And we don't want our character to be able to walk on water, at least not yet in our game, right? So the way we fix that is we just got to go into our static mesh here for the actual water plane. And if you scroll down on the right hand side, we need to change the collision type. So instead of collision block all, what we want to do is switch this to water body collision. Now, if you don't see this option here, this just means you haven't activated the UE5 water system. If you haven't done that, you could try using one of these other presets like ignore only pawn or something like that. Uh, but I found that it works great if I select this to water body collision. And now if I try this again, no more walking on water. Yep, that's okay. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. So now that we have a means for identifying whether there is water, how do we identify what sound to play based on the water? And really it comes down to the depth of the water, right? And so to get that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two different traces. We're gonna take the trace to solid ground, the sphere trace that we did last episode, and we're gonna compare that to the line trace we now have, and we're gonna get that difference. And if that difference exceeds a certain threshold, then we'll play, let's say a shallow sound or a medium sound or a deep water sound. So let's start setting that up. So if you go back into your animation blueprint, the very first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change our transform to be starting at a higher level. Basically, I want it to be all the way at like head downward because if the player's already in water, if the trace starts at, let's say their hip, it's not necessarily gonna hit the surface of the water. So I wanna start it high enough up that it identifies that the player's in water. And the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna simplify some of the things we already did last episode. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take all of this trace functionality that we set up last episode and we're just going to collapse that down to a function. Once you collapse that down, you can go to your functions and this one I'm going to call footstep sphere trace by channel left because I need to differentiate by channel or by profile, which is the line trace. And we'll do the same thing for this one here. So select all of this stuff. We're going to collapse it down to a function. And this one's going to be footstep sphere trace by channel right. And the other thing I'll do is I'll just categorize these two functions. So I'll give them a category of footstep and this one too. One thing I want to call out is that when I collapse this function, it actually preserves the outputs here. So if I go into that function, it's outputting our execution pin, but it's also outputting the location and the physical material from our hit result here. But there's actually a third output that we're going to need. And that is we need to return whether or not this hits something at all, because the player could potentially be like floating in water and there's nothing underneath him. And we don't want to play a sound in that case. So to do that, I can select our return node here and we're going to add an output. So I can do plus sign, and this is going to be called trace hit question mark. And we can just connect up our sphere trace by channel right to it. And we can do the same exact thing for the right function, trace hit question mark, connect this up. So basically that's gonna return a true or false. Did it hit or did it not hit? Now, if it didn't hit, we don't want it playing a footstep sound. So that's exactly what we're going to set up. So I can set up a branch and then only play the sound if this returns true, that there was a trace hit. The other thing I like doing is just cleaning up a little bit of the spaghetti, move these down by creating a reroute. There we go. And you could do the same thing down here for the right side. Now, one other thing. So if we go back into those two functions, make sure to connect up the false also, because if it didn't hit something, well, we might still want to do something. So we want that to return. Same with this one. So now back to our line trace that we started. So I'm going to get rid of the print string here. We don't need that anymore. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to check to see whether the physical material that was hit, if that's equal to two equal signs, water. So we can search for our water PM and there we go. 
And if it was water, then this branch node will be true. And if not, then it will be false. And so if it wasn't water, it's going to go straight on and just do its regular old footstep thing right here. But if it was water, so that's where it gets interesting. So I'm going to copy and paste this again here because it's still going to do our footstep sphere trace. It's still checking, okay, where is the actual ground underneath the water? And that's what this is going to check. And then based on the difference between the location here and the location from this, then we're going to get a water depth. So now, how do we get the height difference between our water location, where the water is, and our ground location? Well, it's pretty easy. So we're going to break these two vectors. So break one, and then we're going to break this one. So I'll drag out a pin from this one, and I'll break here. And we only need the z value, right? Because that's the height. So we need to get the difference between these. So we're going to subtract the water. Water is always going to be on top. So it's going to be water minus this one. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to pass this water depth into a new function. And that function is going to determine what kind of sound to play. But we're going to use our blueprint function library that we started last episode. So you could get to it one of two ways. You could just double click on the footstep sound if you've got that set up from last episode. And I'll just show you where we created that. So that was under a folder called blueprint function libraries. And the reason I created it in this folder as a blueprint function library is so that really any human character in our game could use these footstep effects. And I'll go into that. So we've already got two functions in here. We got our footstep sound and our jump land sound. But now we're creating two more functions. So we'll start with one, add a function. And this one's going to be called our footstep water splash sound. And this one's going to have four inputs. One, two, three, four, four. The first one is going to be splash sound location. This is going to be a vector. So all locations are vectors. Next one's going to be water depth. And this is going to be the float that we pass in. Our next one's going to be footstep ground speed. And this is going to matter for shallow water because we're going to have different sounds for walking or running in shallow water. And that's going to be a float. And then the last one is sphere trace collision hit. And this is going to return whether or not it even hits something under the player. Because if it doesn't hit something, well, we know it's deep water, we could play that sound. So now that we've got this function, I'll just compile and save. And I'll call this function in our third person character here. So I can just do this and I'll say footstep water. There it is, footstep water splash sound. And now we can connect up our water depth. We could take our ground speed variable, which is under our essential movement data. We could also copy it from here, but we can just do this. Get, connect that up, and then connect up our trace hit there. A lot of spaghetti here. And then last but not least, splash sound location. So is that going to be at the water ground location where the ground actually is underneath the water? No, it's going to be where the water is. So it's going to be here, and that's going to connect up there. And that's going to determine where the sound actually plays. So now back to our function. So the first thing let's do is create four local variables for each of these four things. So we'll right click, promote to local variable, boom, right click, same thing. So our first one, this is going to be our sound location. Second one's going to be depth of water. Third one's going to be ground speed. And our fourth one is going to be deep water. Actually, we got to flip this, right? Because the collision hit, if true, it's not deep water. So what I'll do is I'll just say not and then a not Boolean. And that's going to connect up here. Get rid of this. All right, so we just did a bunch of stuff. Let's regroup. Let's talk about what's going on here. So when the foot comes down, so what is it doing? First, it's tracing by profile. It's finding, okay, did I just hit water? If not, it just does its regular footstep sound, all's good. If it does do water, okay, it then does a second trace and it says, find something that's not water underneath it or try to. Does it successfully hit? If so, passes that in. If not, passes in false. And then it gets the difference between those two and it passes those in as well. So now we're at the point where we've got all the information we need to ascertain how deep is the water there. Let's play the appropriate sound. And we're going to start with our deepest water first. Now, to be honest, this is probably never going to happen with a footstep, but we're going to need this for jump landing in deep water. So we might as well set it up here. So we could drag out a pin, branch. And if the water is really deep, what do we want to do? I'm just going to do a reroute node, and it's going to play a sound at location. So what location? Well, we already got that, right? We got our sound location right there. 
So what sound is it going to play? So for our deepest water, I'm going to go all the way back to our sounds, character, human, footsteps, water, depth five, full body. So this is the deepest water, right? So the body is fully submerged. So we're going to take this one, drag that in there. There's our sound cue. So it's going to play this sound. And so now how do we determine the other sounds to play? So for this, we just need to set a series of other thresholds. So for example, if the water is deeper than 75, play this sound. And that's just going to be with a bunch of different branch notes. So we're going to do a branch and we're going to get our depth of water here. And we can't connect depth of water up to a Boolean. That doesn't make sense. So we got to instead do if it's less than or greater than. So if it's greater than 75, so that's going to be pretty deep water. So for this, I'll just copy both of these, paste them here, connect these up. And for this, we just need our not submerged sound. So I can drag that in. And so for this one, we're not talking about jump landing yet. We're just talking about walking. So let's go back to our depth for thigh level and we'll get our walk cue and we'll connect that up. And then we just need to replicate this a few more times. So paste this in from the false branch because we're basically going shallower and shallower down this chain of events. So now if it's greater than let's say 35, and this is going to be, well, not our thigh level, but more of our knee level. So we can connect that up, just the walk sound. Copy and paste again. And so for this threshold, this is going to be very low because remember we had a puddle sound and then we had like an ankle deep sound. So anything more than let's say five, like five centimeters above the ground, it's not going to be the puddle sound anymore. So we'll keep that threshold very low. And so I'm going to go into our water and an ankle depth. But for this, keep in mind, we have different sounds for walking and running. So what do we need to do to figure out the right sound to play here? Well, we need another variable, right? We need to use our ground speed. We can drag that in. So that's how fast the player is running. And then from the ground speed, we can say, okay, if that's greater than 300, I think that was the threshold I set before, then the player is running, right? So we can branch and connect that up. And for that, we're going to use the running sound. So let's go into running. We'll drag that in. And then we can copy this again. And if they're not greater than 300, then that's the walking sound. And now the false here, we also got the same kind of thing. So for our false branch, this is when the water is really shallow. So again, we evaluate ground speed. And then if we go to our water puddle, we've got a running. There we go. And then we got the same thing for walking. Compile, save. So I think that's everything. Let's just zoom out, check this real quick. Now this part we probably don't even need. I don't think there's a harm in keeping it there because that would be really deep water. But we're going to use it for the jump land. So once we make that function, you'll see. So the next thing is to test this out, right? So let's compile. Let's go back to our third person blueprint. Let's go back to our event graph. We've got our footstep water splash here, but we've only set all this up for the left foot. So let's set it up for the right foot. So we've got all this stuff. And now let's take all of this. So I'm just going to drag all this out all of this and all of this. We'll copy it, we'll paste, and I'll disconnect this pin. This old stuff is going to connect up to the false there. And because it's the right foot, I just got to switch the Y to negative 10 because that's going to switch it to the other side of the body. And we've also got to switch out the footstep sphere trace by channel left. We'll switch that out with the right. Delete this one, and I think we are good to go. Let's test this out, compile, save. And so we still got our effects on land, so that's a good sign. So let's go into water now, see what that does. Yep, there we go. What about deep water? Yep, there we go. And then really deep, if you listen really carefully, you can hear it. Barely there, but it is there. And it's doing that because the line trace is happening from the head, that 220 level, and it's going straight down. You see it actually hitting the water there. But there's still two problems here, right? Because one, if I jump in, nothing. And then the second problem is I'm running full speed when I'm up to this high water. That's not realistic. So first, let's do the jump sound effects because that's more relevant to our core purpose of this episode. But then all the way at the end, cherry on top, we'll do the water speed change. So if you navigate back to your blueprint function library here, what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this function and then modify it slightly for jump sounds. So right click and then duplicate. And this one's going to be jump land water splash sound. 
And now for this, for jumping, we don't need to know how fast the player is moving. So I'm actually going to delete this variable. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to delete our footstep ground speed input. So I'll delete out this. That's going to simplify things a little bit. Now for this, the really deep sound, that's going to come into play, I'm sure. But we also have to add one additional threshold here. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these, just drag them down a little bit. And I could take this, pull it up, and then connect this up. All right, so we have five thresholds. The first one's actually going to be 70. And this one is going to be our not submerged sound. So we can go back to our water and depth five full body, not submerged, drag that in. The next threshold's going to be 40. And for this one, I can go to our thigh level. And this is going to be our jump land. The next one's going to be 20. So this is about ankle level. And if I go to water and a knee, jump land, there we go. And now for these two, we no longer need our speed differentiator. So we can delete out this, we can delete out this. It's just going to be straight up how deep is the water. So we'll connect these up. And this one's going to be, if I go back to our depth two, jump land, drag that in there. And then our final one, same kind of thing. So delete this. And this is going to be our depth one, jump land. Over to water, depth one puddle, jump land, there we go. And I can delete out this branch too. And just connect up the false. So it should look something like this. We are all set, compile and save. Let's go back to our third person character blueprint. Now, here's where this gets a little tricky because think of jumping into a pool. Is the sound playing when your footstep actually hits the bottom of the pool or is it when your foot hits the water surface? Because as it stands now, this particular jump land event isn't actually going to be activated until you're standing at the bottom of that pool. And that's not realistic, right? We need it to play the moment that the player's body goes into the water. So the best way I've come up with for handling this is back to event tick, unfortunately. But the good news is we're only doing line traces, which are not very performance intensive. And even better, we're only doing these line traces when the player is physically falling, jumping in this case. Because if they're not falling, we don't need to continuously detect, are they about to hit the water? Okay, so how do we use event tick in the animation blueprint? So for this, if we come up to the top here, these are all the animation stuff that's all there out of the box. And basically every tick it's checking, is the player currently falling? And that's what we're going to evaluate. So if falling is true, so I'll do a branch here, then we're gonna do some cool stuff. So here's what we're going to do. So I wanna copy all of this stuff right here, this, all of this. So basically all of our new stuff, and I'm gonna paste that way over to the right here, because I don't wanna mix that up at all with the original stuff that we've got from our animation blueprint. But if the player is falling, if that's true, we're gonna connect this up and then we're gonna do the same kind of thing, line trace by profile. But for this, I'm actually gonna do the line trace directly in the center of the player's body. And so I'm gonna make this just about 10, just a little bit ahead of their body. And the Y is gonna be zero, so it's right smack in the center. And we're gonna keep this roughly the same. So it's gonna start at the head, go down to their toe. So the moment it detects water hitting their toe, then this happens. If it doesn't hit water, then no biggie, nothing happens. So I can move all this down a little bit. And now this is gonna get kind of crazy. Let's compile, save, try this out. This is not gonna be our final state, but I wanna show you what happens here. Yeah, you see it? It's doing continuous checks right there. Doesn't sound terrible, right? It sounds decent, but the problem is it's playing that sound every single one of those traces that's going down. So I experimented with a few different ways of basically reducing that repeating sound. And the best method I came up with was basically using a delay, but using a delay after the fact. And let me show you what I mean. So we're gonna create a new variable that basically checks has jump landing occurred in the last half a second. And if it has occurred in the last half a second, then don't do anything. And that way basically we'll have a single sound when the player jumps out of water and then another sound, a single sound when the player jumps in because enough time will have passed that 0.5 seconds that we could still do one of each. So we're gonna create a new variable on our animation blueprint called activated jump land effects. And that's a Boolean and that's what's going to assess has the sound already played. And when we have Niagara effects, we can tie this all together and that's starting next episode. So I can drag that in, get activated jump land effects and branch. And for this one, we don't want to do the sound if it's true, right? So if it's already been activated, we don't want to do all that stuff. So only if it's false will we do this. 
now. How do we set it so that it takes a half a second for that to be reset? So the first thing I'm going to do, if I come down to the end of this string, if I drag in that variable again, and actually we need to set it, because what I'm going to do is as soon as that sound plays, we're going to set that to be true. And then after it's true, I'm going to have what's called a delay of 0.5 seconds, and then we're going to set it back to false. And if it's false, then it can go ahead and do all this again. But if it's true, it's going to get stuck right here. So we'll drag out, we'll do a delay node, and delay is exactly what it sounds like. Basically, the node prevents all of this from happening until this amount of time passes. So this is going to be 0.5 seconds. And then when completed, I can then set it again, and this is going to be back to false. The last thing, don't forget to do this, is we've got to switch out our function here. Instead of the footstep water splash sound, we need our water jump land, jump land, water splash sound. And so we just connect up the same exact kind of things. So from here, right there, and from here we get our water depth, and from here we get our trace hit, and then I can delete out this. And we don't need our ground speed anymore, I can delete that. Not for jumping. Compile save. Yeah, so then we got a single sound. Now obviously it feels incomplete because we're still missing the actual splash effect, but that's going to be Niagara next episode. But before we end the episode, two things I want to go over. One is to how to troubleshoot this. So if you're having the wrong sounds play at certain depths, what I would do is I would do a print string of whatever depth is being returned here. So what you could do is you could drag out a node, do a print string, and what I like to do sometimes is drag out from here and do an append. And I could say something like water depth, just so I'm labeling it. And then I can connect this up. And what that's going to do is it's going to print the water depth at every time that that gets triggered. So if I jump. Yeah, so you see it there in the top left. So it's a little bit shallower, a little bit shallower. And that's a really good way to help you troubleshoot the thresholds, whatever you want those to be. I'm just going to come back in and delete that out now. Now the very last thing that we're going to do, cherry on top, is we're going to set our player to start slowing down when they start getting into deep water. And then as they're coming out of water, they're back up to full speed. So I'm actually going to do this on a footstep by footstep basis. So as they're stepping, the game's evaluating, okay, how deep is that water and changing the speed accordingly. So we're going to focus on this part of our graph for both our left and our right footstep. So right after the splash sound, here's what we're going to do. So the first thing is our character's speed is stored on our character. So not our animation blueprint, but our actual character. Luckily, we already have a reference to our character, so we can drag that in. But in order to change that speed, I need to cast to our third person character. So I'll connect this up. And that's going to allow us to communicate between these two blueprints. And for this, I'm actually leveraging the stuff we did in our very first real episode on blueprints, which is episode four. So you can go back and check that out. But in that episode, we set up two variables. We set up max run speed and max walk speed that we could toggle between. And so from here, from that reference to our third person character, I can get our max run speed. Because whatever speed our character ends up being in the game, so let's say they get some sort of boost and they're all of a sudden running at 800 instead of the typical 500, then we can get whatever that reference is here. And so now we need to subtract from this however much we want to decrease the player's speed based on the depth. So I'm going to do a minus. And in playing with this, what I found was what worked best for me is getting the depth here. And then I'm going to multiply this by five. So basically, if the water is 100 units deep, like a meter deep, then they're going to decrease their speed by 500. So then I'll connect this up. But I also want to clamp this, right? We never want their max speed to be below zero. So I think I'm going to clamp it to something like, let's do 20. So 20 will be the minimum. And then the max run speed, that'll be the maximum. So how do we set the new movement speed of the player, the actual movement speed? Because this is a reference variable. It's not the player's actual movement speed. And so for that, I got to get a reference to the character movement components, so character movement, get, and I've got to set our max walk speed. And that's our actual speed of the player. And that's going to be here. So now this is starting to get pretty crowded. So I'm going to make some space here. So I'm just going to drag all of these to about there, all the way down. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all this, copy it, and we're also going to paste that for the right foot right here. Connect that up. And also I got to connect up this to there. All right, let's test this out. Will the player slow down in water? 
And there we go. So they slow down and almost too much in some respects. Yeah, so maybe I want to lower that threshold a little bit so that they don't slow down so much. So what I could do is maybe lower this down to four instead of five. You could play with that and see what you decide. Now, one thing that's happening here is that the animation is actually switching to a walk in place animation and we never set up the anim notifies for our walk in place animation. So because we never set up the anim notifies, this is never being triggered again to speed up the character. So we've got to do that. So let's go into our content and then into our characters, mannequins, animations. So for me, I'm using Manny and we've got to go into the walk in place. And for the walk in place, we've got to do the same thing we did last episode where we got to add notifies at the left and the right markers. So add skeleton notify left foot plant, just going to move that over, line those up and same thing with the right. So once you got those all set up, you can save and we'll test this out one more time. So what should happen is our character slows down into the deep water and then they should speed up coming out of the water. There we go. Yep, because the atom notify should be recalibrating that accordingly. But we also want to do one more thing, which is when they're on regular ground, we should get their speed back up to full speed no matter what. But their full speed is going to vary depending on whether the character was walking or running when they entered the water. We want to keep that consistent. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy all of this down below, because keep in mind, this is what happens when the character is not in water. So we're going to start with all that and we could delete out all of this stuff because we don't have water depth to contend with. And we need to get three variables from our third person character. We need to determine are they walking or running? So we could say is walking, so get walking. And then we also need the max walk speed. And we've got our max run speed. And so here's what's going to happen. So if the character is currently walking, we want to set them back to walk speed. And if they're currently running, we want to set them back to the run speed. So this to this, and then if false, do the same kind of thing but our run speed. And then I'll also copy this for the right foot. Oh, I was on the right foot. All right, for our left foot. So here's the moment of truth. So jump into water. Yeah, deep water, can't move very fast at all. And as it gets into shallow water, perfect. But there are a couple of issues here. So one thing I noticed, so let me toggle to walking and then I enter the water and suddenly I'm running into the water which isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, but it's kind of weird. So let's see if we can uh, if we can change that. So if I exit out and let's go back into our animation blueprint here. So what's going on is in this part of our blueprint. So it's always setting the max run speed, even if the player's walking uh, as soon as they enter into the water. So as soon as this line is triggered. So what we can do instead, I'm just going to move this down can get walking. So get walking. Yep. So that was the Boolean variable that we created in episode four of this series to determine whether or not the player is currently walking. And then I can branch from that because we're going to do something different if the player is walking or not. So if they're not walking, this is fine. This totally works. But if they are walking, we actually need to get the max walk speed, max walk speed. There it is. And this again is something we created in episode four. And what I can do is I can then compare that if it's greater than this value right here, which is truly the maximum speed that should be possible in the water. And I'm just going to move this out a little bit to create some space. I'm going to do a branch here, connect this up. So basically, if the character's max walk speed, so let's say it's like 150, is greater than what should be allowed in the depth of the water, then we need to set a new max walk speed here. And this is a little bit confusing, right? Because this max walk speed is tied to the character movement component, which is different than this one. I probably should have titled this something different in episode four, but this is the new variable that we created in episode four that sets the max walk speed threshold across the game. So that could be adjusted continuously throughout the game. Whereas this one is what actually controls the speed of the character right now. So anyway, if the current max walk speed is greater than this, we need to adjust the speed downward. So in that case, we need to do this again. But let's say the player's just entering in the shallow water. So this is going to be less than this value right here, in which case it does absolutely nothing and they keep their max walk speed. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete this out down here. So this is our right foot step and I'm going to copy the same stuff into our right foot step connect this up and don't forget to connect up this node to here. Let's try this out. All right, so I'm walking, I'm walking. Nice, and I only slow down when going into the water. I don't speed up. 
perfect. There is one little glitch still that I can like constantly spam caps lock over and over again to toggle between walking and running. And there's that gap between footsteps where the character speed will temporarily be adjusted. There's an easy fix for this. I could just go into the third person character blueprint and I could do a line trace down to see if I'm in water and prevent the actual change in the movement speed. But I think that's a good challenge for you. So if you wanna to try to work on that on your own time, I think you can leverage everything you learned in this episode to make that happen. Now there's one other last fix that I wanna do before the close of the episode. And that is that if you remember last episode, our jump sounds, they played a little bit too late. It was maybe like a 0.2 second delay. And the reason for that is they didn't play until the character's foot actually came down because it was tied to the landing animation. And so I think we have an opportunity to change that now because in our animation blueprint, we're doing that continuous line trace detection downward whenever the player is falling. So here's what I mean. In this part of our blueprint here, we're doing this continuous line trace by profile. And then only if it hits water does it set this delay to be 0.5 seconds. But what if it doesn't hit water? What if it hits something else? So that's where we could play our first footstep sound, our jump land sound when landing on something. And that's gonna happen before the footstep actually comes down. So what I'm thinking is the left footstep when jump landing can do this, and then the right footstep, we could keep this down here, and that would be actually when the animation starts for jump landing. So what I can do is I can literally just copy and paste this right here, copy that, come up here, and this is for the left foot, and then paste that here and connect this just like that. Now there's one other piece of setup we need because I don't want this jump land sound to play continuously, right? We need the same setup here where we do like a five second delay to make sure that it doesn't play again. So I'll connect that up. And the last thing I'll do is I'll just disconnect it here. I won't delete this out quite yet, but let's test it out first and see how that works. See if the delay is a little bit better. And this is the delay on a solid surface like rock. What's neat about this is that I actually hear the two separate sounds. I hear the sound of the left foot hitting and then the right foot hitting. And I could just delete out the left foot sound here. And I'm also gonna comment for our right foot jump land sound. I'm just gonna say, right foot jump land effects left foot is done on the event tick above so that's basically it for the setup for this episode but the problem is we've got a lot of spaghetti and so i think it's just good practice that we collapse all this stuff to functions wherever possible so just like we have footstep sphere trace by channel left and right i also think we need to collapse the line traces so i'm just going to select all of this and then right click, collapse the function. And for this function, I'm gonna rename it and it's gonna be footstep line trace by profile left. And we'll also do one for right. And then this one's for right. So we select all that, collapse the function. Footstep line trace by profile right. The other thing we should do is we should go into these functions, change our return value names, just so we know what those are. So this is gonna be the impact location, and this is gonna be is water, and it'll return whether or not it's water. Compile, save. Do the same thing for our other function. Impact location is water. And then what we can do here is instead of this up here, we can just drag it in. So footstep line trace by profile left, and I'll connect this up. And then here, I'm just gonna do our impact location to here and then also to here, and then the Boolean over to this here. Now, before you delete out all this stuff, it's always a good practice to test it out. So let's go ahead and do that. Jumping, let's jump on rock. Yep, water. Uh-oh, so water is not working. We gotta troubleshoot that. So look at this, I literally just forgot to connect up the function. Let's try it one more time. All right, footsteps on rocks are good. Over to water. There we go. All right, so now we can delete this out and we can do a few more collapses here. So we've got our footsteps sphere trace by channel left. So the thing about this is it's a little bit more forward relative to the player than our jump land. So this is about 10 units forward and this one is 30 units. So it's about you know, 20 centimeters forward, but I think that's fine. I don't think that's gonna make a big difference. You could actually create a separate function just for that, or you could pass in a variable and update the X here. 
but I don't think it's necessary. It's just 20 centimeters. But regardless, we're gonna test this out. So we connect that up, connect up our location, our physical material, and our trace hit, and then make sure to connect up our execution pin because I forgot that right here. And I'll do the same thing for our right down here. Dragon footstep sphere trace, connect up here, connect up our Boolean, physical material, and location and down here. So then we can delete out all of this and delete out this and we can greatly simplify, reduce the function just like this. And I added a couple reroute nodes as well. How much cleaner is that? Same kind of cleanup down here. And I'm just gonna comment all this stuff and I'm gonna say jump land evaluation and effects. So we still got a little bit more cleanup. So I'm gonna collapse this to a function, this stuff on the end that adjusts our speed based on water. So I can collapse that to a function. And this one is going to be rename update speed in water. Same thing down here, I'm just gonna chance it. I'm gonna delete that out and we're gonna get our update speed in water function. And I'm just gonna adjust the variable there. So this input is gonna be water depth. Last one, restore normal speed for these. So collapse to function. This is restore normal speed. Same thing here. I'm cutting corners here. I should really be testing this out before I actually delete it, but for the interest of time. All right, so now we need to test our speed. Yeah, perfect. And get it out. All right, so if I'm walking, Great, and if I'm walking out, still walking, and then toggle back to running, perfect. Last thing, I'm just gonna classify each of these functions. So we have a category of essential movement data, that sounds pretty good. But actually, the footstep line traces, those are going to be footstep, and this one too. And then for the update speed in water, I think that's the essential movement data, and same with the restore normal speed. And now for these, so I'll comment and I'll say left foot footstep effects. And by the way, this is exactly what we're going to add on to next episode for Niagara. And right here, right footstep footstep effects. Nice and clean. One last really quick issue fix. I found that jumping in the water sometimes. No sound, so what's going on here? So this issue also happens if you're falling from a very tall height and you're plummeting very fast into the water. And what's happening is if your line trace isn't long enough, it may not have the opportunity to hit the water before your feet actually hit a surface. So it's a really quick fix to fix this. We're gonna zoom into this part of our blueprint and we're going to go into the function for footstep line trace by profile, left. And instead of setting this to start at 120 and go down to negative 120, I just increased the length of this. So I started at about 200. That's actually above head level. And then it's going down to negative 170. So that's about half a meter below the player's foot. So even if I jump from a very high height, it should always hit the water every single time. So that concludes today's episode, guys. But there's one last piece to our water here that really we're missing. And that is... Where's the actual splash when I jump in? And same with walking, there should be some splashes with footsteps. And so in the next episode, we're starting Niagara effects and we're starting them with water splash effects. There's a great free pack of effects available. I'm gonna show you where to get that and we're gonna connect that right up to everything else we've been doing. So I hope to see you there.